Welcome back to Good Morning Interbike. We are joined on this segment with Tony Ellsworth. Tony, welcome to Good Morning Interbike. Thanks. It's good to have you here. You know, before we talk about these gorgeous machines which are surrounding us at the moment, I think a lot of people are always intrigued when they look at a down tube and they see someone's last name. And then <laughs> the question is, how'd that happen? So we were talking a little bit about this earlier. How did that happen? How did you get in the bike business? Well, you know, I, how I got in the bike business is, is it an interesting question. I, you know, I've always loved bikes. I was six years old. I remember I got my, you know, my training wheels off. Uh, I think my dad bought me a bike from Johnny's Toy Store or something because <laughs> I was fighting over somebody. Some, I bought the bike at, uh, at kindergarten or something, and dad said, well, we'll just go get you your own bike. And uh, training wheels came off in really short order. And the bike for me just kind of opened up the neighborhood. Yeah. I could get around, wind in my hair. And the bike has just always been my friend. I was a skinny little kid, you know, too small for ball sports. So, you know, cross-country running and long-distance cycling was always something I had a passion for. Um, I got out of, out of college and I went into uh, to, uh, the financial services industry and um, really focused on that and bought a house, had a kid, started a business and you just really missed, uh, you know, really deep down missed a lot of uh, time on the bike that I had when I was younger and, you know, before I was a family man and all yeah. that. So I started recommitting time to riding a lot and... Um, uh, Southern California is pretty crowded with cars, and while I love to road bike, the idea of mountain biking off-road and getting out on the trails and, you know, uh, that kind of thing was always super exciting to me, but I was always disappointed with the, with the level of, uh, you know, old-world craftsmanship and frame building that was brought to the mountain bike, you know, early on. And uh, so while I was whining about that with riding with my friends, they said, well, you should just make your own frame and stop whining about it, and so I did. And it turned out really nice. Well, hold on, hold on. You were in, you were in <laughs> the financial services sector. We talked earlier, you did some, you know, you focused on international relations in college. How do you just decide, I'm going to build a bike? Well, you know, it's a good question. I, I, I have a very, um, you know, I have a little bit of a, okay, so I, I'm mechanically inclined. Okay, right? yeah, you must be. I, you know, I don't really, you know, <laughs> after making bikes, you know, pretty much solo, these bikes that have been top of the industry for 25 years, I, I guess I have a gift for it. So. You know, uh, and, and my friends knew that. They're like, well, you should just make your own frame. You can yeah. do it. And, so, and I did. And, um, and uh, you know, it turned out great. And then they wanted one. And somebody else wanted one. And then their friends wanted one. And before, before long, I was, uh, you know, setting up a run of uh, 25 and 50 of them down there in San Diego. And, I'm, you know, and they told friends and they told friends. And to this day, I mean, Ellsworth is marketed largely word of mouth, which mm -hmm. is probably, you know, my failing as a businessman not to be a more, <laughs> you know, astute marketer. But um, that's how Ellsworth Bikes started. And I remember at one point when we were trying to figure out a name for my, for my bikes, and I had a little ad agency down there in L.A., you know, try and come up with a really cool name. And at the end of the day, they're like, dude, put your last name on the down tube. It's what it's all about. Yeah. And... Um, then that is the way it's been for 24 years this year. Wow. Suspension mm. is really something that a lot of people think of when they think of Ellsworth. Mm. What, makes, what makes your suspension better or at least different? So, uh, you know, as a cyclist, so first I'm a cyclist and second I'm a bike designer, right? So as a cyclist, one of the magical things about a bicycle is how far it can propel a human under their own power over terrain. And so if you're talking about mountain bikes, you're talking about you know, a variety of terrains, yeah. in which case you know, suspension becomes a, a valuable asset uh, on, on the bike to carry a human over that terrain. Well, the disadvantage of suspension is that it's, it adds complication and it adds you know, in that complexity is additional weight. And in that complexity also is an articulating you know, rear wheel where your energy can be lost in the articulation of right. that wheel. So as a cyclist first, and as a, a frame designer, I figure there's like a, a sacred trust where I can't take away from the efficiency of a bike in order to give it suspension. So I give it suspension, I've given it something that enhances the ability to cover terrain, but I can't do that at the expense of the efficiency of the bike. And so um, I developed a suspension system that would have zero energy loss under pedal force. And that suspension system is called instant center tracking. 
uh, basically referring to the, to the engineering principle of uh, the instant center or the virtual pivot of a linkage. So that virtual pivot or instant center is aligned on the chain force line. Mm -hmm. So that when you pedal the bike, the force that, that normally you would put to your pedal that's to carry you forward isn't lost in the activation of the suspension, ever. So it's a zero energy loss suspension system that remains fully active to do the job of suspension all the time. And on some of the early, we all remember this, on some of the early full suspension bikes, it was a real problem. And it really turned people off yeah. of full suspension bikes in the beginning because you'd go bouncing down the trail and feel like you, what you were putting in just wasn't coming out yeah. in the back. And you know, that's better mask today mm -hmm. through brilliant valving on shocks, but the, that problem is still you know, replete in the industry with full suspension bikes. It's covered up better, yeah. it's marketed better, and yeah. it's certainly improved, but that problem's still there. Instant center tracking is the only internationally patented suspension system in the world because it's legitimately can be quantified as a zero energy loss system. Now, when you, when you add suspension to a bike, in many, uh, in many instances, you also add weight. Mm -hmm. And you know, as we look around at, at your bikes, you're using carbon. And you've been using carbon for a long time. Right. How long have you been using carbon? Well, uh, the, the uh, absolute truth, which is uh, this, this is the 20th anniversary edition of the absolute truth. And it's gorgeous in that candy apple color. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, we used uh, carbon fiber in the rear uh, linkage of the absolute truth in 1993. And you know, really for, for me, uh, you know, again, as a cyclist first and then a bike designer, it's not about uh, you know, um, being a proponent of a material or a wheel size. It's really about utilizing the correct material or the correct wheel size. We'll talk about wheel size in a minute, I think, but the correct material for the job at hand. So carbon has the, the benefit, one of the strengths of that material is that it's, it can be very, very light. Another strength is that it can be um, you can take advantage of its anisotropic principles to get characteristics out of the frame that you can't get out of an isotropic material. Right. So, um, you know, we try and use carbon where it's best suited in the frame. Now, with the uh, technology to get that kind of high pressure um, molding out of a monocoque carbon front triangle, it's a, it's a great place to save weight and increase stiffness and increase the, the character using the anisotropic principles of carbon in the front triangle of a bike as well as the rear. It's interesting because in the early 90s when you first were using carbon, I think there, there were probably a lot of people who thought, I don't want carbon on my mountain bike. That, that, right. that just sounds scary. Right. Uh, certainly, that's gone now, right? Uh, <laughs> yes, although I, I don't, I'm, sure that, I'm not sure that question should be completely erased from people's mind. I mean, carbon fiber is, I mean, let, let's face it, I mean, carbon is a molecule. Right. It's soot in a fireplace, and it's a diamond on your wife's finger. Right, so it's not that, car again, the carbon the material is neither good nor bad, it's what's done with the carbon that makes it good or bad. Um, most of the carbon in the industry, as we've seen this, you know, just, you know, carbon's almost like a, like a disease in the industry where we've forgotten all other materials. Although each material has its strength, there's so much carbon here, this, most of the carbon that's being used commonly in the bike industry is a recreational grade carbon. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not a high modulus carbon like we use in an aerospace or you know, that we're putting in the new Boeing Dreamliners right. and that kind of thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a recreational grade carbon that uh, China became very proficient at working with when they were making carbon tennis rackets. So um, that material we need to design, you know, very carefully with, and I think it's important for customers to ask, you know, what's being done with this carbon? It's not that all carbon is, is created equal. Um, I use uh, aerospace procedures in all of our carbon. We're getting about 300 PSI compaction across the full geometric shape of the frame, whereas the recreational grade carbon is generally compacted, they're pretty satisfied between 90 and 115 PSI. S substantial difference. Substantial yeah. difference. Um, and just to kind of take you back, it's why we used carbon in 1993 on the original Absolute Truth in the rear of the bike, is because we used a male mandrel and then an autoclave where we could pressurize the carbon on the male mandrel. We could get incredible compaction on the material in a straight line, and so we used that for the the, sta the chain stays and seat stays of the carbon. But to get that kind of compaction out of a monocoque uh, front end really is not, I mean even now it's not very common, um, but now we're, we're getting that kind of compaction you know, out of the front and so we can, we can use that in both the back and the front in monocoque shapes, in beautiful shapes. But um, we actually, the first 
absolute truths where we use carbon in the back end were actually made on hockey, hockey stick mandrels. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, we basically took a hockey stick mandrel and then we, we milled it down to get the right ID and we wrapped it, you know, wrapped it like we wrap a hockey stick and then right. used it like a tube. And um, that, that particular, I mean, <laughs> I, somebody had a, um, one of the early uh, carbon, I think it was a Y bike. I probably shouldn't name any names. <laughs> One of the kids in the shop took one of the chain stays and just literally cut through, you know, could just saw through one of those early monocoque, uh, you know, carbon. So even though you have carbon and carbon, one of them is terrifically harder mm. and terrifically more strong than another simply by the resins that are used, the heat of the resins, how that's sustained, the amount of pressure that's put to that resin, just like the difference between a diamond that can cut glass and soot in the fireplace that you can decorate yeah. your face with, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. You mentioned wheel size, so let's go there for a moment. Original mountain bikes, 26 inch. Mm. A few years, a few more than a few years ago now, somebody said, hey, let's go larger. Let, you know, we can get over things easier, 29 inch. We seem to have settled in the industry, at least at the moment, at this <laughs> 27 and a half. Some people call it 650B. Um, what's your feeling about where, where are we and, and which wheel is suited for what kind of rider or what kind of condition? Well, really, I'm uh, very interested in the 28.25 <laughs> diameter wheel size that we're seriously. We're <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> Please don't add more wheel sizes. <laughs> oh yeah, the people that carry inventory really don't <laughs> right. want that to happen. <laughs> okay, so you know what? I, I've got opinions about this. So if we, you know, just um, I'm happy to share my opinions about it. First of all, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a 26 inch diameter wheel. There's nothing wrong with a 29 inch diameter wheel. Again, it's not the diameter of the wheel. It's what you put it on, what you do with the diameter of that wheel, how the geometry of the frame is designed around that diame the, the diameter of the wheel. So, you know, when the 27.5 wheel first came out, I, I, I just thought, well, you know, that's great. I can package our suspension perfectly and have great standover in our 29 inch platform. So, you know, if the industry decides that 27.5 is what they're going to support with rims, tires, tubes, forks, et cetera, it's no problem for me to design a 27.5 inch wheel in an instant center tracking, full suspension mountain bike. It's no problem. So I didn't really have a strong opinion one way or the other on right. it. Um, what I do like about the 27.5 platform is that it is possible to package that diameter wheel with the same geometry and standover as a 26 inch wheel, which is what we've done on our four new 27.5 inch models. We've packaged that 27.5 inch diameter wheel, which does give you the advantage of a larger diameter wheel, um, into the same package as, a 26, as our 26 inch wheel bikes have been for 23 years. Nice. So, um, we're, uh, we're going to be stepping away from the 26-inch 26, 26 wheel platform simply because it's not necessary. We can get the extra small, you know, five-foot tall gal on an extra small Ellsworth with the full travel instant center tracking on a 27.5-inch wheel. So um, we do the 27.5 a little bit size specific in our product line. Mm -hmm. So we're doing 27.5s in extra small, small, medium, and large. And then we do the 29-inch in small, medium, large, and extra large. Makes sense. When, uh, you know, the diameter of the, of the wheel being 29 inches is excellent. I'm a medium, you're a medium. We were just talking a little bit about which one would be better for yeah. us. I actually ride both diameters. Um, there's no question, the larger diameter wheels, you know, you, you sacrifice a little of that flickability. Um, if you're a cross country guy and you're riding in the, twee, you know, in the trees, we talked about Park City, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. white aspens, just right. barely you can get through. And, um, and you're not a very a large person where you need the larger diameter of the wheel in order to biokinetically fit correctly on the bike, then 27.5 is a, is a great way to go. Mm -hmm. um, I ride both and I, and I like both. Um, I, you know, the rolling diameter does make a difference, but you, you know, again, there's advantages and disadvantages. You've got greater rolling diameter, you have a larger rolling mass, um, and the, the wheel bases are a little bit longer. One of the things we do with our 29 inch bikes to to um, make sure that they are still have as much of that flickability and nimble handling as possible, as can be retained with a larger diameter wheel, is we really adjust the geometry for the 29 inch wheel. Sure. And uh, the industry also has kind of taken a funny, a funny direction where they're sure that if it's a 68 degree head angle on a 26 inch bike, it should be a 68 degree head angle on a 29 inch bike. And the rake and trail numbers on a 29 inch wheel are entirely different. And, um, it's actually important to, you know, to adjust that rake and trail, and what that ends up with is a little steeper head angle on a 29er than you would roll on a 26er. 
yet if you'll test it at high speed and loose conditions, you'll find that the stability is still there mm -hmm. by way of the larger diameter and the longer wheelbase. We talked about the absolute truth. Tell us about the other bikes you brought with, with you today. So the, uh, the Epiphany CXC275, there's a lot of letters in there, but uh, what we found, the Epiphany has a, been a fantastic platform for us. Uh, it was introduced in 2006 at 130 millimeters of travel. And then uh, that fork, the, you know, Fox got that fork from 130 to 140 and then to 150. 140 on the 32 millimeter stanchions was really about as far as I felt comfortable mm -hmm. going, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise you get too much flex at the fork. So we settled the Epiphany in at about 140 millimeters of travel. And, it, you know, it really became, you know, the Epiphany was actually the cross country brother of the moment, which was the all mountain version of the ID in 2002. It was a six inch travel cross country bike. And um, it was severely misunderstood. People thought, six, six inches, that's awesome. I can downhill on right. that. And you're like, no, 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 that's a cross country <laughs> bike with long travel. You know, because the suspension was so energy efficient, is today so energy efficient that adding travel doesn't take away from the efficiency of the bike. So mm -hmm. six inch cross country was possible where it hadn't been before. Mm. So the Epiphany is the third generation of our long travel cross country bikes. And um, people love it. It's so utilitarian that people love it for its cross country ability because it's light and yet it has long travel, but it's very nimble. Mm -hmm. And then people say, I love the lightweight and the long travel. I want to take it in all mountain applications and race it in Enduros, right? So this year, uh, we actually split the Epiphany into two different models. The Epiphany Carbon XC275, CXC275. That retains the cross country geometry of mm -hmm. the Epiphany, that cross country characteristic of the Epiphany. And then we've done an Epiphany uh, 275 Enduro, which is, our, it's actually rendered in aluminum, and uh, that has a little bit more of an Enduro race geometry, bottom bracket adjusted a little bit, seat angle adjusted a little bit, head angle adjusted a little bit. So I brought the cross country version of our, of our Epiphany. Nice. And uh, on our booth, 5125 is the, is the aluminum version. Now down at the end, mm. a road bike. Yes. Th I was surprised to see it come in the booth, so tell us about it. Well, it's, uh, it's actually the Proform Tour de France series bikes that I was uh, lucky enough to hook up with these guys in Logan, Utah. Now, they, they're the ones, you, you see their TV commercials, right? right. They, they do the indoor training right. bikes. Yeah. Really exciting indoor, uh, you know, indoor training opportunity where you get up on TV and you get a chance to ride the stages of the tour. Right. Uh, electronically simulating a climb, the headwind, everything. It's a pretty cool experience. They are very... Um, very much want to expand into the outdoor biking as well as the indoor biking. And um, they commissioned me to design their, uh, their road bike line, which nice. is being debuted here. Nice. So that's the Alpe de Uez, named after the, the climbing, you know, the famous climb. Do I really need to say it? Right? <laughs> well, I think most people know, <laughs> but you right. never know. <laughs> anyway, 800 gram uh, carbon fiber frame, and we're using the same aerospace technology and aerospace carbon fiber that we use in my mountain bike frames. And um, really exciting, exciting bike, and was super happy to be able to be involved as a designer and bringing that to life for them. That's great, it's a beautiful looking bike. I, I have to tell you, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm listening and Tony, you, you started your business almost in a garage and I'm <laughs> listening to the way that you, you describe the evolution of your bikes, um, uh, the, the knowledge that you have and the passion that you have for the technology. Uh, you're reminding me of other people who have started businesses in garage, garages, <laughs> you know, the, the Steves I'm yeah. thinking of. Because you've got that passion, you've got the knowledge, and you've got the know-how. So it's just, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I, I feel like we could talk all day and I could learn <laughs> a ton, but I know you want to get back to your booth. So thank you for joining us on Good Morning Interbike. It's been thank, a pleasure. Thanks for having me. We are going to have more videos from right here at the 2013 edition of the Interbike Trade Show. So please stay subscribed to the Interbike TV YouTube channel, and we will see you in another episode of Good Morning Interbike.